the Rock Church and World Outreach Center podcast. We hope that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a word from Pastor Jen Cobray. Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus, giving you all the praise, all the glory, all the honor. How good it is to be in the house of the Lord tonight. Lord, we just honor you and praise you and give you glory with everything that we have, all of our hearts. Here's our hearts. Fill it with your way, your word, your want, your desire. Lord, we'll give you the praise. Now, Lord, we're fully aware that the Holy Spirit is the teacher. Welcome, Holy Spirit. Touch us, heal us, strengthen us, encourage us, guide us, guard us, direct us, motivate us to be all that you would have us to be, all that the Father designated us to be, all that the Son paid for us to be, all that the Holy Spirit inspires us to be, empowers us to be. Lord, we want to be that. And so therefore, Lord, here's our heart. Fill it with your way and your want. And God will give you the praise, give you the glory, give you the honor. As you bless us tonight, we would ask that you bless all the churches in the Inland Empire, as well as around the planet that are preaching, hearing the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. There are our brothers and our sisters. Bless our Baptist brothers and Lutherans and Methodists, Episcopalian, Charismatics, Pentecostals. Thank you for Calvary Chapels and Harvest, Oak Valley and Oasis, Inland Christian Center, the Assemblies of God, Foursquare Denomination. We thank you, Father, for our Adventist brothers and sisters, Catholic brothers and sisters. At no time do we think of ourselves as better than them. We see ourselves as co-laborers, workers together in one field, building one kingdom, not a man's but yours. Bless Ecclesia tonight. Bless Trinity tonight. Bless Emmanuel Baptist in the way in San Bernardino Temple. Lord, as you would bless us, and Lord, we'll give you the praise, give you the glory in Jesus' mighty name. With a great big shout, we all say amen. amen. I wanted to say, go to your Bible in Hebrews, but I'm not going there tonight, am I? We're in part number two of controlling the carnal mind, and this is really an important understanding because... Uh, a few years back we taught it, and then a few years before that we taught it. But I know that for most of you that are in here that heard it a few years back, I know you forgot it. How do I know that you forgot it? Because I forgot it. <laughs> and I heard it five or six times more than you heard it. And sometimes we have a tendency, we don't practice stuff to forget stuff. And this is so important for us because the title of the message is Controlling the Carnal Mind. This is part number two. And it's very important that we not allow our carnality to control our future and our destiny. What does that mean? It simply means that we make decisions based on our flesh. What we're being told by our senses. We gather the directions in life. We make the decisions in life. You know, all the things and choices of life, we just make them all based on our feelings and what we think and what we have calculated out. The problem with that, it seems very natural, and boy, it is natural. It's so natural, we, we all do it. But the problem with it is you'll never please God living that kind of a life. You'll always end up a failure You'll always end up discouraged and frustrated, wondering where God's at, why God hasn't come through for you. How come people get answers to prayers, but I don't, you'll say. Where is God when you really need him? I tried that, didn't work. I did everything I know how to do, except you didn't know how to understand who you are. Now let me say that again. You didn't know how to understand who you are and how you're made. And how this all works so that you can, by the power of the Holy Spirit, control your carnality, your flesh, your body. For most of you, your body and your flesh, for all of us, to tell you the truth, it really runs most of our life and it ought not to be because we will never please God doing that. Now, how did we, remember from last week, how did we get in such a pickle? How did we get in such a problem that all of us live such carnal lives we literally base our future on how we can calculate things and directions that we get from our flesh. How do we get there? Remember in Genesis, it goes all the way back to the second chapter. God places, if you will, I think it's verse 15, 16, 17. God places in the garden Adam and Eve and says, you know, here's 
the garden, you're to tend it and take care of the garden. Everything you're going to need is in that garden. He says, in all the trees in the garden you may partake of except one tree in the midst of the garden, it's the tree of knowledge of good and of evil. And then he says, and when you partake of that tree, you will surely die. And what, they were, what he was talking about is that you will die in a relationship with God. That you are no longer going to be somebody who's going to live a, a vital life based on what God says. You are now going to live a life based on what you think, based on what you can figure out, based on your feelings, because the tree, listen to me, the influence of the tree is really fascinating. It influenced their thinking, where before all of their thinking was about God, what God said, what God spoke was right, what God did was just, how God directed us, there's no other direction but the one of God. And God says, if you partake of the tree of knowledge of good and of evil, what's going to happen is you're going to now die because your relationship is no longer based on me. It'll be based on you making decisions from your carnal flesh. And you die off. And that's exactly what happened. If I use the terminology, the influence of the tree, you'll know what I'm talking about. Is that all right? Are you there? Are you on the same page with me? Can I talk to me now? Do you understand when I said the influence of the tree? When you partook, you didn't personally partake, but your ancestors did. And it's passed along in your bloodline. You now have the ability to decide for yourself what's good and bad, what's, you have the knowledge of good and evil. Before that, you had no ability to do that. All you saw was God. All you had was a relationship with God. Jesus comes, sets us free. Now watch this. And we are learning how to get back into that relationship of trusting God following God, hearing from God, being obedient to God, and seeing God as just every area of our life. If you do not do that on earth, you're not going to like heaven. (laughs) Did you get that? If you do not learn how to live here on earth, trusting God, loving God, Seeing God is all important and all the directions you need for life are God. And no matter what happens, God is just in everything. You're not going to like heaven at all. And let me tell you something. Can I tell you something? Is it not that he kicked out Lucifer who had his own independent ideas about how heaven ought to be run? You think he's going to let a whole bunch of us in there with our own ideas? That are ideas from the knowledge of the tree of good and of evil? Somebody needs to tell you the truth. If we don't learn this while we're on earth, there's a lot of people that are going to be able to go to heaven, not going to be very happy there at all, and probably won't want to stay. Could you get to heaven, guess who's boss? Not me. Not you. So we're learning how to do this. Is that okay? Remember Paul writes, and he writes this under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit in the book of Romans. Remember that in the seventh chapter? Go there with me. And last week, I just want to review these few things. He's got a war going on in the inside of him, just like the war you have on the inside of you. You know, your mind wants to serve God, but your flesh says, I want to serve my own thing and do my own ways. Follow me? Has anybody ever been there besides me? I want to do what God wants. I want to do the will of God. I want to please God. I want to do, but oh, there's another battle going on on the inside of me. It's my flesh that wants to serve the law of sin. You know, and it's just a horrible experience. And Paul writes about it. In verse number 22 in Romans, let's just take a look at it. Together, uh, the seventh chapter, verse number 22 of Romans says, For I delight in the law of God according to the inward man. In other words, can I just separate the word law so you don't misunderstand that? You know, sometimes we, th- every time we see the word law, because we're, oh, I don't know how to say this, because we're not theologically so in tune in the church yet, every time we see the law, we think of the Ten Commandments. It is not talking about that. Not talking about that. 
Notice what it says. He says, I delight in the law of God. Now, the law of God is God's ways, God's rules, God's wants, God's desires, God's plans. Let me tell you something. The principles, see the word law there? Circle it and put the word principle in there. I delight in the principles of God. That's easy for you to understand. It gets you out of thinking. He's talking about Ten Commandments. It's not. According to the inward man. In other words, there's something on the inside of me that really w delights in the things of God. But verse 23 comes along, he makes this statement. But I see another law in principle in my members. Now this is a members being in his flesh and his desires, his want, you know, his senses. There's a law, there's a, the, the inward law wants to, wants to serve the laws of God. The inner man wants to serve the laws of God. But he says, uh, he says, I see another law. There's another principle going on and it's going on inside my flesh, inside my body, inside my members. He says, warring against the law. Now here's another law of my mind. Everybody say mind. mind. So now all of a sudden the law of God he wants to serve, but there's a law on the inside or a principle that's on the inside of him that's warring against the principle of his mind that's telling him to serve God. Follow me? And brings me into captivity to the law of sin. There's another law. So in other words, the members that I have that want to serve the Lord, this inner man, but there's another law in my members, and it wants to serve the law of the principle of God, comes along, and it's warring against the law of my mind. The mind says, I want to serve God, but my flesh wants to do this. I want to serve God, but I just, uh, I want. Let's put it in terms that we can all understand. Have you ever known you shouldn't eat that, but you ate it anyway? <laughs> That's just what he's talking about. In other words, there's something, there's a battle going on on the inside of you that says, man, I, I, I really want to serve God, but I, but, ah, I got to eat that thing. <laughs> and, and that's what he's talking about. And the law of sin, which is in my body, my flesh. So where's the law of sin? It's in his flesh. Which brings us to verse number 24, which is fascinating. Verse, oh, wicked man that I am. See, without God... We are wicked men. We're lost. Why? Because of the knowledge of the tree of good and of evil. You had a choice, but didn't have the choice before. You chose to serve God. You sought God's way. You trusted God. God was a just God. Whatever he talked to, you walked with God in the cool of the day. Man, you had it made. Now all of a sudden you did what God told you not to do, and now you're making choices for yourself instead of God making the choices on telling you where to go. Oh, wicked man that I am, who will deliver me from this body, 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 flesh members of death? Which brings us to verse number 25, which is a cool little verse. I thank God. Thank God he didn't leave us in 24. 24 is where most preachers will hang you up and say you really can't get out of it. You got problems. Paul had problems. Don't worry about it. Oh, baloney. Verse 25 comes along and says, oh, thank God, through Jesus Christ our Lord. In other words, I've got the power to do what I know and want to do through the power of the Lord. And he says this, so then, with the mind, everybody say mind. I, I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. Now sin, when it's allowed to continue your life, breeds something called, same no? Death. Now look, let's put it in terms that you understand. Marriages don't work because they don't understand this simple principle. Families don't work because they don't understand simple principle. Anger doesn't work. Control doesn't work. Nothing works. You don't understand the simple, simple principle that God gives you. He gives you the power to get out of the flesh, get in the spirit. Where in the flesh you will die because it'll, you'll serve the law of sin, bring you to death. Marriage will fail. Children will fail. Economics will fail. Finances will fail. Prayers will fail. All because of the law of sin. But if I can get out of the law of sin and with my mind serve the law of God, which is my inner man that really wants to do that, then somehow, man, I, I, I need that. I need to know how to do that. Now, what if I told you 
that the Bible tells us exactly how to do it. And you just haven't been taught. The Bible tells us exactly how to get out of the flesh, how to get out of carnality, how to get out of death, how to get out of the body, how to get out of those members that want to serve sin and get to a place where you could serve God if you just operate in the principle. Is anybody listening? Okay, so in order for us to understand that, I have a bunch of pages that I'm going to put up. But we're going to have to, before we put the pages up, we're going to have to take a look at something together. If you understand how you are made, you will understand what Scripture is talking about. Let's, let's go there for just a moment. I'm made with joints. The joints help me to move, help me to manipulate, work things, grab things. I can grab food, put it into my mouth. My fingers are there to grab the little items, the bigger items. My arms are there. Uh, my legs cause me to walk. Uh, I, 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 I partake of food. Food comes in and energy is drawn from the food, goes to the blood. The blood is rejuvenated. It takes place through the uh, oxygen and rejuvenation of the food, the vitamins that are coming out of there. I am made a certain way to function a certain way. Why? So that while I'm here on earth, I learn how to live in the principles of God and not live in my own principles. Why? Because I'm made after the image of God. God is not made after my image. Therefore, God's not up there trying to help me and be part of what I want. He's teaching me how to become part of what he wants. Uh, he's not, listen to me, he's not joining me in my influence of the tree. He is asking me to get rid of the power and influence of the tree and get back to the original relationship with him which Jesus Christ opens the door for us to do. Okay, now, when you understand that, you understand how you're made. You're made to function. And it's the same way in the spirit realm. Now, let's take a look at 1 Thessalonians, the fifth chapter. In 1 Thessalonians, the fifth chapter, is anybody listening? Verse 23. Interesting little verse, it says, now, May the God of peace himself sanctify you completely. And may your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless at the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I'm talking about how you're made. If you understand how you're made, it'll understand how this principle on how to serve God is going to work, okay? So that you don't serve the flesh for the rest of your life, but you learn how to serve God because you understand how to take control of the flesh. You're made, and notice what you're made of. You're made of spirit, soul, and body. Body, soul, and spirit. You are a three-part person. Let me, if I may, put up page number one. You are a three-part person. Body, Soul and spirit. Just as simple as that. Now the word body means flesh and members was another word for that. You know, and uh, we'll see how that all works. So here's a body, soul, and spirit. That's what you're made of. Just as simple as that can possibly be. Let's, let's talk about it. Put a page two, if you would. And first let's talk about the body. The body is the flesh it's the members, it's the physical being. It's all the parts that physically work and draw upon you. When one part is shy something, it'll draw upon you. When a part, your body speaks to you all the time. It speaks to you its needs, it speaks to you its wants, it speaks to you its desires, it speaks to you its thinking. It doesn't think, but I mean it has passions that constantly speak to us all the time. Case in point, when you're hungry, man, I could just eat a horse, you say. Something told you you were hungry, your body would speak it to you. When you're tired, your body speaks, to you. oh, man, I'm just exhausted. So this first part is your physical being. This is what the Bible called flesh. This is what the Bible called members. This is the body. Are you following me? So when you're carnal-minded, 
You're somebody who's being directed by the flesh. Let's put up page number two. I mean, page number three. The soul, third part, uh, the, the soul is part of your body. So let's talk about this. The soul is a part of your body that is, is an interesting part because it's the one that carries your thinking process. And your thinking process is where you would get the simple words of the soul. Go to the next page. And it says minds, will, emotions, and thinking. So now we see the flesh. We see the body. We see the members. Where carnality comes from. And then we see the second part of us, the soul. That's our mind and our will and our emotions. This is our passion button. This is where everything comes out of what life is all about. This is your how you think and process stuff in, in a mental capacity. Is your soul. Then let's put it up, if you will, page number six. And the spirit, body, soul, and spirit, page number seven. And the spirit is the spirit of God, or if you will, is that part of the physical body that houses the spiritual things of God. Some call it the spirit of man, but the spirit of man houses the spirit of God. And so we find ourselves three parts so that we can function properly. Body, soul, and spirit. Let's, if you will, put up page eight. So all three of these parts have their own characteristics that are described in scripture. The body, flesh, worldliness, carnality. This would be what we described as members also would have been another word that we could have put under the body. Then up on top is the soul, the mind, will, emotions, your thinking process. Then the third part of you is the spirit. That's the part that houses God on the inside of you. The spirit of man that houses God now on the inside of you. Three, three parts person. And let's put up, if you will, page nine. Any two of these that work together void out the power of the third. Let me make a statement again because you just missed it. Any two that work together void out the power of the third. Hold on, one more time. If my spirit and my soul work together, that would be called to me life and spirituality. If my soul was working with my body, that would be fleshly attitudes. Let's put up the next page, if you will, page number 10. Any two that work together voids out the power of the third. Simple as that. So if the soul works with a body, it voids out the power of the spirit. Spirit can't get anything done. If the spirit works with the soul, voids out the power of the flesh. That's what you want. So the flesh doesn't control you. You say, then why is it the spirit and the body don't, can't work together? See that little arrow up there and that little void out sign? Because the Bible makes it very clear that they're enemies with each other and never will work together. And here's the problem with most people that call themselves Christians. They see themselves working together with their flesh. It'll never happen and you'll never get the job done. In fact, while that's up there, I'm going to take you to Galatians in the fifth chapter, and let's see if we can split the screen on that, John. In Galatians, the fifth chapter, starting in verse 16. I want you to hear what the Word of God has to say. So there, your body, soul, and spirit, what they mean up on the top part. Galatians, the sixth chapter. Here's Paul writing to the church of the providence of Galatia under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. So now he's teaching something to these people written down for you to learn and understand and find thousands of years later. Verse number 16 says, I say then, walk in the spirit. To walk, the word walk, circle in your Bible, means to live out life. Live out life in the spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. Now, how would I live out life in the spirit? 
other than the fact that the spirit has got to work with my soul that voids out the power of my flesh or the body. Verse number 17, for the flesh lusts against the spirit. There's the arrow up there in front. For the flesh lusts against the spirit. There's the arrow up there in front. And the spirit against the flesh, they're at war. They cannot work together. There's no way God Almighty is going to work with a tree of knowledge of good and of evil. He is God who created everything. There's no way God's coming down to man's level. Man's got the power now to get up to where God's at. See, that's what we're trying to find. The lust, the flesh lusts against the spirit. And the spirit, notice the capital S on the word spirit, against the flesh. And these are contrary to one another so that you do not do the things that you wish. Have you ever wanted to do something and not been able to do it? That's why. It's because you're trying to work them both and they don't work. You cannot live in the flesh and be spiritual. It's one or the other. And what we do, we do it in marriages, we do it with our children, we do it with our anger, we do it with our frustrations, we do it with everything. We get frustrated, angry with people, we get disappointed with people because you know why? We're in the flesh instead of the spirit. We judge, we criticize, we complain. We want to have a good marriage, but we can't get the marriage working good. You know why? Because the marriage doesn't work good because as long as you're in the flesh, uh, trying to get the spirit in there, it won't work. you got to get the flesh out and get the soul and the uh, spirit working together to, to overcome and overshadow the f flesh or body. Are you following me? Uh, could you just pop up the next verse for me? I mean, the next page for me, John. So, <clears throat> when the body works with the soul... It voids out all the power of the spirit, and you're, you're a mess. And then all of a sudden, you're out there by yourself. Only thing you have left is your temper, your judgment, your anger, your frustrations in your life, what you think life ought to be like, and that's been the problem. Even though you wear a cross around your neck, you have a bumper sticker on your car and call yourself a Christian, and you pray four hours a day, it doesn't make one bit of difference. <laughs> doesn't make one bit. You can pray eight hours a day until blood comes out of your face, isn't going to make any difference until you understand when the flesh and the soul work together. When you're thinking about what the flesh is feeling and meditating on that and building a life around that, you have just voided out the spirit. Amen. Next page, John. But if the spirit works with the soul, all of a sudden, the spirit of God is always by the word of God. The word of God makes a statement about something. And my mind starts to grab a hold of what God is saying instead of what my flesh is telling me. Yeah. Voids out the power of the flesh. And now all of a sudden, guess where I'm at? I am blessed. Are you following me? So important. Let me catch up with John here just a minute so that I can keep on page with him. Verse number, put up page 13, John. When the body and the soul works together, it brings something and a product, it brings us what? Death. Lust, sin, desires, passion, death. But when the soul, the mind, and the thinking works together with that which is spiritual, could I go back to the next page, John? Brings life. Life to your marriage, life to your finances, life to economics, life to your business, life to your children, life to the people, family around you brings life. And your choice tonight is whether or not you're going to stay making decisions based on the knowledge of tree of good and of evil, which is just very natural for you and for me. It's just the way we've been brought up. It's the way life is. We make choices based on what we think and what we feel. And then we try to bring some spirituality into it. And guess what? They don't work together, so it breeds death. Or we're going to live in life, and life is when my mind and thinking lines up with the things that God says, which is spirit. It's that simple, my friends. This is the whole thing. You will live life. Now, Paul writes after the seventh chapter. Goes right into the eighth chapter. You know as well as I do, there's no chapter one, chapter eight, verse one. That's all put in by the translator. So that same thought 
who will deliver me from this wicked man that I am? Thank God for Jesus Christ, you know? Goes right into the eighth chapter, but it really isn't the eighth chapter. It's still writing to Paul. So let's go to the eighth chapter, verse number one. Eighth chapter, verse number one says this. There is therefore no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Now watch this. Who do not live out life according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. You have a choice if you're born of the Spirit of God to live out life according to the Spirit. The problem with it is you didn't know how to do it. Now you see a bit how to do it. Verse number two. For the law of the spirit of life. What side is that? Right side. Remember that would be the soul and the spirit of God working together. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus had made me free from the law of sin and death. Left side. So all of a sudden the right side, the law of life, makes me free from the law of death. Left side. I always go right side, left side. On your, on your screen, you remember the right side was the soul working together, wasn't it? With the spirit. Brings me life. So the law, go back to two, if you would, please. So the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law, left side, of sin and death. In the verse number three, I'll just read it quickly for you. It really, it's just kind of an, uh, something, it's, it's really important, but it's not where I want to go and what I want to teach you for tonight, so I'll just read it. It says, what the law could not do, that it was weak through the flesh, God did sending his own son in the likeness of sin, flesh, on account of sin, and condemned sin in the flesh. Verse number four, watch this. That the righteous requirements of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not live out life according to the left side, but according to the right side. Wait a minute. If you think that's good, watch the next verse. Verse five. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. The pivoting point of your future is where you put your mind. Your mind can either go to the left or it can go to the right. If your mind stays on the left, you lose and die. Your family fails and sin takes over and it won't be long before you're not in church at all. You won't even like God at the end of your life. But if you live and your mind is on the right side, the things of the Lord instead of the feelings that are coming from the knowledge of the tree of good and of evil through your flesh, may I say this to you, you'll be blessed. Now, with that verse in mind, let's pop up for, uh, page 15. Split the screen for me. Put it up, verse 15 at the... And then can you get me, uh, that's what I want. Now let's see how it works. The pivoting point of your successful is what you set your mind on. That's why in 2 Corinthians, the 10th chapter, verses 3 through 6, talks about casting down imaginations that exalt themselves, exalt themselves above the knowledge of God, bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ, and then it says in verse number six, and punish those thoughts which are out of order, because that's left side. Interesting verse. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the spirit, the things of the spirit. So how do I set my mind? It's either on the body, the worldliness and carnality, which brings lust and sin and desire and passions. So my mind is working with my flesh, my, uh, my uh, members and my body, and I end up in death. Or my mind is working with the spirit of God that dwells on the inside of me, that's always in line with the word of God, which brings me life, love, light, hope, faith. And uh, I should have put the word future you cannot notice an arrow with a, a, a wipeout sign in there. You cannot have the body and the spirit working together. You will fail so you can't do what you want to do. And that's why you've tried and it doesn't work. This whole thing is about what you have in your mind. No, it's really about what you have inside your heart. But your mind is the pivoting point. That's what I mean by this. This whole thing is, this is not some 
mind over matter, some psycho-cybernetic goofball stuff. But your mind is the pivoting point, and what you set your mind on is what your flesh will become. What your flesh tells and speaks of you determines whether you die or don't die. So if you cast down imaginations, that's what your mind is doing, and bring into thought, uh, captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ, right side, getting rid of left side. That's how this works. I'm not thinking about that. I'm not going there. Oh, let's, let's get it real. Have you ever, some of you, I'll put it like this. Have you ever hung around, maybe you quit smoking and you're, you're just, you know, you hang around people that are smoking. For six years after I stopped smoking, I would say, can I smell your cigarettes? I go, oh, they smell so good. Oh, they so good. You know, it won't be very long before you start hanging around thinking about smoking before you're smoking again. Same thing with pornography, same thing with anger, same thing with lust. You know, you, have you ever mad at your wife and you think about it before you really are mad at her? Oh, shut up, man. You know what I'm talking about. You little chickens, you just sat there so quiet. You fought the fight mentally before you got into the fight. So when you got into the fight, you had something to say. You need to recognize that fighting it mentally before you get into it is left side. And get that out and put it in the right side. Before you get into the fight, you won't have a fight. You'll have life in your marriage. You following me? You fight this stuff mentally first before you even got into the fight. You were ticked off about something and you went off and went off mentally, 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 mentally. So when the husband came home, what'd you do? You just tongue lashed him. And you knew exactly how to do it. Why? Because you hadn't been thinking about spiritual things. You're thinking about how you're going to get even. That's left side, not right side. Am I okay? Are you okay with me? Be as mad at me as you want. Tell me, let me tell you something. My age, I don't give a flip if you like me or don't like me. You know what I mean? It's not like I'm running for office or something. I give a flip if you like me or not. Somebody just needs to tell you the truth and stop messing with you. you want to know why you're all screwed up? That's why. I'm all screwed up too when I don't do this. Let's be honest with each other. It's not like somebody waved magic wand and said, you're the pastor, you have no problems. I got problems too, just like you got them. If I don't do the right side, left side, I've, my problems stay and I don't ever get anywhere. Is anybody listening? Could, could you put up verse 6 just for fun? For to be carnally minded is, oh, look at that. Wait a minute. For to be carnally minded is what? That would be what side? Hmm. But to be spiritually minded is life in peace. What side is that? Uh, now, can I ask you a question? Do you want death or life in peace? peace. Wait a minute. Anybody that wants death, stand up and let me slap you right now. <laughs> At least let me throw you out of here or cast the devils out of you. Everybody wants life and peace. You know you do. You've worked all your life for it. You went on diets all your stinking life to get on life and peace. And here's how to do it. <laughs> to be carnally minded is what? Yeah. Oh, shut up. You just speak up if you're going to speak up. Don't give me that little wimp stuff. What are we? To be carnally minded is what? Yeah. What side is that? Yeah. That's when the soul works with the what? But to be, but to be, but to be, but to be, but to be spiritually minded is life in peace. What side is that? That's when the soul works with the what? Spirit. <laughs> I mean, it's just so, so darn cool. Do I, have, do I have another verse, verse 7? Because the carnal mind, what side is carnal? Left. Is it enmity or enemy or against or cannot work together against 
God. For it is not subject to the law principles of God, nor indeed can be. Verse 8. So then, those who are in the flesh, what side is that? Left. Left. Cannot please God. Now, wait a minute. Try to get in heaven if you don't please God. Go to heaven, stand before God, say, I'm here to get you to do things my way. I've had 75 years on this world doing things my way. I have done it my way. (laughs) And see how far you get with God. You know where Adam walked in the cool of the day? You're going to be walking in the hot of the hour. (laughs) Now, I'm just being honest with you. We don't think we ever have to do anything, you know. We, just, we don't have to do nothing, you know. I just be a stupid Christian and live my life like everybody else. Well, I'm telling you something. There's something to do here. I want to please God. Yeah. Now, you're listening to me. I, I don't know about you, but I want to please God. So tomorrow, when you're confronted with a problem, or even as you drive out the parking lot today and nobody <laughs> lets you in. Yeah. Have you ever noticed how you're tested before you even get out of the parking lot? So tomorrow when it happens, think about what you're thinking about. Think about what you're thinking about. Because that is what you're going to hook up to. Unless you get rid of it if it's contrary to the ways of God and bring in something that's from God. When Deborah's mad at me, she loves me and I love her. We're nuts about each other. When she's mad at me, She has to cast down imaginations that exalt themselves above the knowledge of God. The knowledge of God says, he's your man. He loves you and you love him. You take care of him, he'll take care of you. He'll take care of you, you take care of him. That's the knowledge of God. She has to cast down all that other stuff. That stupid jerk. He just, uh, he just felt, uh, he did, 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 did. He, she cast that all down. That's why we're still in love after all these years and love more today than we ever did when we were kids. So let grandpa teach you something. And 12 grandchildren later, now you've heard 11, but guess who's having another one? Yep, yeah, mama. No, oh no, no, no. All right, wait a minute. I got I to gotta cast that imagination way down. Just kill me now, God. Luke, Pastor Luke. That man's pregnant. He's going to name his son after me. The most holy reverend. James Stephen Cobray. Hardly. Don't even know what he's going to name him some weird name again. He's into weird names, you know what I mean? His first son's name, Bjorn. Took me three months to figure out how to say the kid's name, you know? What's a Bjorn? This has nothing to do with the teaching. It just got me off the left side. Got me on the right side. All right, have you learned anything tonight? Come on, give the Lord a great big praise. See you that? Now, I want to make sure everybody's all right with God before you leave. So give me just a moment more. I want to ask you a question. You are great listening to the word of the Lord tonight. I believe you got something. If you didn't, you will get it. So could I have everybody remain seated? Nobody get up. Nobody move around. Ushers, could you uh, control people coming in and out if you could, please? And let's talk just for a moment. I want to make sure... Everybody's all right with God before you leave. Nothing could be worse than coming in the house of God, hearing the word, singing songs, clapping your hands, laughing, having a great time, walking out of this building, your heart stop, you die, and you go to hell. Nothing could be worse than that. Now listen, I want to ask you a question. I want you to answer it in your heart. 
Nobody will know but you and God. Here's the question. If you were to walk out of this building tonight and your heart stopped, bang, and your heart stopped, would you go to heaven? Here's the question. Or would you go to hell? Now, nobody wants to go to hell, so let's talk. Some of you said, here's your answer. Your answer says where you're at, by the way, so check yourself out. Some of you said, well, I think I'd go to heaven. Did you know that nowhere in the Bible does it say you can think your way into heaven like whoever's the most positive thinker gets there? You're not going to make it. Somebody needs to tell you. Some of you answered and said, well, Pastor Jim, I hope, I hope I'm going to go to heaven. Can I tell you something? Nowhere in the Bible does it say you can hope your way into heaven like I hope, I hope, I hope, I hope. You're not going to make it. Somebody needs to tell you you can't hope your way into heaven. Some of you might say to yourself, my answer is different. I, I love God a whole lot, Pastor Jim. I guess I'm going to go to heaven because I love God. Can I tell you something? Nowhere in the Bible does it say because you love God, you get to go to heaven. It's not in the Bible. You're not going to make it, and somebody needs to tell you. You say, wait a minute, Pastor Jim. Hold on. My, my reason for saying I'm going to heaven is because I'm really a good person. You know, I give my money to charity. I take care of my neighbor. I'm a good person. Hey, I'm glad, but could you show me that in the Bible where you're good enough you get to go to heaven? Because it's not in the Bible at all. You're just not going to make it. And somebody needs to love you enough, respect you enough, honor you enough, tell you you're not going to make it. You're not going to make it. You know why you're not going to make it? Listen to this. Jesus says these words. Here's what Jesus says. I am the way the truth and the life. No man goes to the Father except by me. That's what Jesus said. No man goes to the Father except by me. That's what Jesus said. In other words, you can't get there your way. You can't get there my way. You can't get there some well-meaning church committee's way. You got to get there his way. And his way is clearly stated in the scripture. I'll share it with you in just a moment. You say, wait a minute, Pastor Jim, hold on. My mom and dad told me I was a Christian when I was a kid. I've always thought of myself as a Christian. You know, they put a cross around my neck or a St. Christopher around my neck when I was a child. And, you know, they took me to catechism class or Sunday school class or uh, Sabbath school class when I was a child. Great. But can I tell you something? Nowhere in the Bible, nowhere, it's not in the Bible, it says because your mom and dad told you you're a Christian, took you to those classes, put a cross, St. Christopher around your neck, gets you to go to heaven. You're not going to make it. Can you imagine that? You're not going to make it. So you need to listen to me. Here's what Jesus says in the scripture, John 3rd chapter, on how to get to heaven. Think about it just for a moment. Before I tell you what he says, here he is, a beaten, bloody mess, nailed to the cross, raised from the dead on the third day so that you can go to heaven. Yep. And don't you think he'd tell you how to get to heaven? Or do you think he just leaves it up? Oh, you know, the, whatever that group thinks is okay with me. Whatever that person thinks is okay. Oh, whatever they do is okay with me. Come on, don't treat God like he's a dope. He's not a dope. He tells us exactly how to get to heaven, John 3rd chapter. He said, these words, you must be born again. Now, the problem with uh, using the word born again is a lot of people turn off immediately when they hear the word born again, they go left side. And the reason they go left side is because over the years, they've seen born again people portrayed by Hollywood movies and magazines and books as really creepy people that are fanatics and weirdos and goofballs. But that's not what Jesus is talking about. Jesus is talking about born again means something different. Here's what it means. I'll explain to you what it means from the beginning of the Bible, the end of the Bible. It means you've given God all of your heart. It means you've given God all of your life. It's an all or nothing relationship with Jesus Christ. Let me, let me say it again. God forgive us in American churches for 250 years. It's an all or nothing relationship with Jesus Christ. I will prove it to you by the scripture. Is that okay? I'll prove it to you. Last book in the Bible, the book of Revelation, Jesus himself is speaking. He says, I'm coming again, and when I come, I better find you hot or I better find you cold because if I find you lukewarm, I will vomit you from my mouth. You know those words? I will vomit you from my mouth. Do you know what he just really said? Here's what he said. People that call themselves Christians 
People that call themselves Christians that are lukewarm are not real Christians at all. And they're going to get expelled from the body of Christ when Jesus comes. Wow, that's a stunning expression. That is shocking. So let's define for you lukewarm. Lukewarm, a little in, a little out, a little up, a little down. Token prayer, occasional church attendance. You're not against God, but you're not wholehearted for God. God is something in your life, but he's not everything. And can I say this to you? Until you make him everything, he'll never be just something. Your call, your choice. You're going to have to give him all of your heart. You're going to have to give him all of your life. It's an all or nothing relationship with Jesus Christ. All your heart what he's been after since the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible and all of your life. Always has been that way. Always will be. You say, Pastor Jim, how do I give him all of my heart? Tonight, how do I give him all of my life in this place? Well, in a moment, let's do it Jesus' way. Jesus said, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father. But if you deny me, I'll deny you. That's what Jesus said. So in a moment, I'll count to three. I'll go like this. One, two, three, and then I'll pop my hands together. Bang! When you hear that sound, bang! Your hand goes up. I'll see your hand go up. What you're saying by the raising of your hand is I don't want Jesus in my head like most Americans. I want to give him all of my heart and give him all of my life. I want to be born again, headed for heaven and denying my presence in hell. I'll see your hand go up. Now, wait a minute. I already know you know who Jesus is or you wouldn't be here. I already know that you acknowledge Jesus and understand who he is or you wouldn't be here. I already know you celebrate Christmas. I already know you celebrate Easter. But that won't get you to heaven because it's not about what you celebrate. It's about who you have in your heart. And you can have him in your head or the rest of your life. Die or go to hell. Even the devil knows who he is. And he's not going to heaven. It's not about what you have in your head. It's about what you've done with your heart. Have you given him all of your heart? Have you given him all of your life? And you got to give it to him because he's not a thief to rob it from you. It's your heart. It's your life. He's not a conniver to make you do it. It's your heart. It's your life. Tonight, here we are in this safe, friendly place. Come on. Tonight is your night of salvation. God brought you in this place to make that commitment of all of your heart, to make that commitment of all of your life. Get out of yourself. Left side says, I don't want to do this. Right side says, you know you should. Follow the right side to life. Don't follow the left side to death. Tonight is your night of salvation. Who should raise their hand if you've been running from God instead of to God? I'm speaking to you. If you've never given him all of your heart, I'm speaking to you. If you've never given him all of your life, come on, you know who you are. I'm speaking to you. If you're one of those people that are in here and you're just not sure, well, then make sure. Don't leave this place until you make sure. Tonight is your night. You say to me, Pastor Jim, wait a minute. You want me to raise my hand? I'll be embarrassed if I raise my hand. I'll feel funny if I raise my hand. Yep, I do. Get over it. It's better that you feel funny in a safe place like this, embarrassed for a moment in a safe place like this, than to exist in hell forever and ever and ever and ever because you care more about what people think instead of what God sees. Tonight is your night of salvation. I've done my job. I'm finished. I'm counting to three, and it's your call. Are you ready? One, two, three. Let me see your hands. Let me see your hands. Let me see your hands. There's one, two, three, four, five, six. Thank you. Back here. There's seven. Thank you. God bless you. Anybody else? Real quick. Anybody on this side? There's eight. God bless you. Didn't embarrass them? I won't embarrass you. Come on. Where are you? There's eight of you right now. Where are you? There's another one somewhere back in here. Back in here, there's another one. Some of their point. Oh, there you are. Thank you. Nine. God bless you. Anybody else? There's another one. Ten right here. Going for God. There's another one. Eleven. Going for God. Anybody else? Real quick. Going for God. Let's give God all of our heart. Let's give God all of our life. Let's don't mess with God. Man, I'm not staying left side. I'm going to have life and peace. There's another one somewhere in here. I already got you. I already got you. It's eleven. Thank you. Anybody else? Anybody else? Thank you. Up on top, twelve. Anybody else? There's 13 right back there on the, in the, by the door back there. Anybody else? Anybody else? Anybody else? Well, let's give the Lord a great big praise for 13 wise people. Here's what I want you to do. 
All 13 of you. Now, I want you to hear me now. You don't get saved by raising your hand. You're going to have to get out of your seat, get in the aisle, bring a friend if you need to, get all of your stuff. Bring a friend if you need to. And then you come, meet me in front. We're going to lead you in a prayer. Now, wait a minute. And do invite Jesus in your heart. There's 13 of you, but I know there's more than that that need to come. So I want all of you to check with your neighbor. Give them a nudge and say, come on, neighbor, I'll go with you. If you need to go, I'll go. And listen to this. Now let's all stand and welcome all the people that need to come. You come right now. If you raise your hand, you're serious about God. You get up here right now. Come on, come on, come on, come on. Because Lord, I give you my heart. I give you my soul. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. And I'll live for you alone. Every breath that I take. Every moment I'm awake, Lord, have your way in me. Lord, I give you my come on, heart. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. I give you my soul. Come on, come on, you come here, come on. For you alone, every breath that I take. Well, God bless you guys for coming. Thank you for coming. I want you to look to your left. See this guy waving at you? His name is Pastor Dave. He's a really good guy. No weird stuff goes on. Now, I want you to put a smile on your face because he's going to pray with you to invite Jesus into your heart. He's going to give you some free stuff to read about, like what to do next. Now that you're a Christian, you need to know what to do next. What would God have you to do? You know, most people have any idea at all. Read this simple little pamphlet. It'll help you out about what to do next. And then thirdly, he's going to introduce you to a friend called Spiritual Personal Trainers. They're SPTs, we call them. You've heard of spiritual trainers, physical trainers. These are spiritual trainers that will meet you before church. Let them spend some money on you, buy you coffee, tea, nachos. Have a friend in church, pray for you during the week, go over some scripture with you, and just encourage you for the next four or five weeks so you can keep on going instead of going back, falling through the cracks. Only takes a few moments. Your people you came with will wait for you. Make a left turn. Follow Pastor Dave right over there. Come on, let's give the Lord a great big praise.